Good morning. If it's your first time here or first time in a while, I wish that you'd take out the connection card in the bulletin so we can get to know you, so I can get to know you. And uh, if you have a prayer request, fill that out. If you want to register for the uh, men's prayer breakfast in just under two weeks, it's on the back there. And also for starting point for the membership class, it's on the back of the connection card. Lots of announcements in there. This is your last week to sign up for the Financial Peace University that begins. There's a note about that in the bulletin. Missions trips information in the bulletin, some statistics for attendance for the last year, lots of stuff in the bulletin. Today we have some really great stuff going on, beginning with uh, the baptism of Charlie Marion. Uh, Sherry, would you stand please? This is Sherry, this is Charlie. Sherry and Charlie have both professed faith in the work of Jesus in the gospel, the work of Christ on the cross for sinners, that they have both uh, been washed by, their, by the blood of Jesus um, and they are both saved today. Sherry has already been baptized. Charlie's about to be baptized. And here today, they're presenting themselves before you, the voting body of Sandy Ridge Baptist Church, uh, for membership. So welcome them with me, will you? <laughs> Charlie is here today, humanly speaking, because Tim Fox's consistent friendship. And uh, we're glad that uh, consistent friendship and consistent witnessing is about as all superstar as any of us need to be to be good witnesses for Christ. You don't have to be Billy Graham to give the gospel or to be consistent to your friends. They do need you though. And here's fruit of a man's ministry over years and years. Charlie told me over a PDQ lunch one time, which is well worth your time. Just anyway, he told me over lunch, he told me over lunch that uh, Tim Fox would stop for, for, for weeks and even years. Isn't that what you told me? Yes. And, and finally, something clicked in this man, and he wanted what had been talked about all that time. Praise the Lord. Do you have some guests you'd like to introduce to us back there? Yes, I do. I have my daughter and my grandson, my daughter Tara, and my grandson Adrian. Oh, we're glad you're here. And a very good friend, Keith Leo. Keith, welcome. <laughs> Charlie, because of your faith in Jesus and because of the Great Commission, because of your faith in Jesus and obedience to his command, I baptize you, my brother, bend your knees slightly, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. <laughs> Thank you. He's got a towel for you up there. Oh, just typical. Don't want any man's help. Come on down here. <laughs> this is Blakely Murr. Blakely has put her faith in Jesus. Very clear testimony. Nikki and I were over at their home Monday, and she put her faith. Now, I want you to know, it was the second interview we had with Blakely. We are so concerned about your little one being born again that it takes more than saying, Preacher, I want to be baptized. We had, in, no kidding, Pastor Bill, in my office downstairs, I think over the summer, we asked her about her salvation, and it was an unclear answer. And I care so much for your children. Pastor Zach cares so much for your children that we actually want your child to be able to express their faith in Jesus without your help because they will not have you at the judgment seat. So that is why we wait. And Monday we had a, she came up to me after service Sunday, said she wanted, and I said, well, let's have, this, let's have this discussion. We talked, she confirmed it then, she confirmed it this morning. She believes she's going to heaven because she's put her faith in Christ who died for her sins. Amen. Blakely, because of your salvation experience, and because of your obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Why don't we all stand and, and greet, greet somebody next to you.
Amen. Let's have our ushers come. That is some good worship. Praise the Lord. Who, do you know that Hosanna means save us now? And it is, uh, it is what the children cried out when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem on a donkey on Palm Sunday. Hosanna. It's a quotation out of Psalm 118. And it is fantastic to be able to sing music, sing scripture on this Sunday morning. I'm glad you're here. Let's see here. We want to uh, let you be seated. And uh, Charlie, you want to introduce, oh, you already did that. I know. Ashley, you need to introduce your guests. Welcome. Who are you pointing at? All right, welcome. Thank you for being here. Anyone else have a guest they'd like to introduce? Ernie, who's that sitting next to you? I feel like I met him. Was that, I think I met you last night, didn't I? Would you, man, I am ringing. I, anyway, <laughs> I guess it's me. I'm standing on the wrong foot. Um, would, would you stand and introduce yourself to uh, you and your, I believe, is that your wife with you? Please stand and introduce yourself to us. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Glad you're here. I don't usually do that, but he walked up to me last night and asked me when our services were today, so that's a blessing. I was at a firehouse yesterday um, uh, receiving a gift to Sandy Ridge Baptist Church from the St. Stephen's Fire Department on behalf of their chief, Sean Green, mm -hmm. and they wanted to sponsor the pew that he sits on, and uh, oh. so we cracked all kinds of jokes about that because it's way in the back, and... Uh, <laughs> And uh, it was neat to have this brother uh, ask us when our services were today, so welcome. Does anyone else have a guest? Like, where's Phil? Phil, are you in here? Wave at me. If, okay, Phil, would you stand? This is my friend Phil Klotz. Uh, he, I brought him this morning, and I wish that you'd help him feel at home. Thanks for being here, Phil. Appreciate it. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. Sue, I thought you had your hand up, but you're just waving at someone, so I won't call you out. I won't draw any attention to you. <laughs> Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to be among your people on this Lord's Day. I pray that you would glorify yourself in this offering and the music. Thanks so much for the opportunity to know good songs that we can sing without much help in the car, in the darkness of our, of our lives, when it seems like we're feeling alone sometimes, we cry out to you and you never disappoint. Thank you for being so real towards us. Thank you for making Christianity easy on us this morning and making sure we had heat in this building. We thank you for the hard work that was done by you on Calvary. I pray that you'd help us to be people that know what it is to carry our cross. Oh, Lord, be gentle. We are people. And we know that you know how we're made and what we're made of. So thank you ahead of time for your understanding. You've been dealing with people for thousands of years, and you're pretty good at it. Thank you, Lord, for this offering, the ability to take what you've given us and to give back to you. You're doing a great job of paying the bills around here, Lord, through prospering your people. There's people in this room today, Lord, that need a special help, uh, some that didn't actually want to be here today, and here they found a way to be here. I pray that you'd help them at some point during the remainder of the service, if it hasn't happened already, that that it would make real sense to them as to why they're sitting where they are. I pray that you'd help us to be not just a friendly church, but a church of friends. That we might be people that reach behind us, in front of us, beside us, and become family to the person who may, ha may not have any. How sad it would be if people would leave Sandy Ridge Baptist Church because they felt like they had no friends. Help us to be the answer to prayer in that regard. I pray that you would meet the needs of those who are recovering from surgery. I think of George Killian recovering from surgery. I think of uh, Donna Austin's mother recovering from surgery. Uh, several others from this week, people who are just really sick and their families are sick. I pray that you'd raise them up, help them to get proper rest and nutrition. And I pray that you'd look after us, O oh Lord, and help us to be mindful of good, wise living. And when we're sick, help us to take the rest we need. I thank you for your kindness through Jesus. Thank you for the indwelling Holy Spirit. And we ask you to bless yourself in today's service. In Jesus' name, amen.
We'll dismiss the singers, but I'd like the musicians, please. I'd like the musicians to play through that. I'd like every head bowed, please. I'd like for you, if you need prayer, you come right now as the musicians are playing, and we'll get some people around you to pray with you. Come on, right away, musicians. Let's get right into it. No judgment zone. You come on down and we'll pray with you. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Please find the book of Mark, chapter number 11. And as soon as you found it, say amen and we'll pray. Mark, chapter number 11. That's good. I like that. The sound of pages turning. Some of you need to get a page sound effect on your tablet or phone. I'm not hating whatever that means. I'm thankful for the Bible you bring, even if it has a screen. Amen. Bring the one you read. That's what I like to say. Bring the Bible you read. My Lord, these are your sheep. I'm one of them, and we desperately need to hear from you. I pray that you'd keep me out of the way. You know in my deepest flesh, I'm all concerned about me. You know if you peel back the Son of God and take away the Holy Spirit and remove from my mind the Scripture, I'm selfish. And I want to be known as the guy that can preach a great sermon. But that is by far way off and far removed from the issue of the hour. So Lord, knowing that I am as much a man as any other human being in this room, and knowing the only thing that keeps me from total error is the Holy Spirit and the wisdom that you've given and the study that you've helped me with, uh, I'm desperately in need of you. And if I fail, these dear people may not get fed today. And so I'm asking you to supersede. 
I'm asking for you to interfere. I'm asking for you to do what you will do and make sure that your sheep find pasture. Thank you for your kindness through Jesus and giving us a book out of heaven. Thank you for using men to write these words. And thank you for giving us the faith to know that they are in fact true. I pray you'd help us to be courageous enough to obey. And we will thank you, Lord, for the person in this room that is not yet saved. I pray that they will come to a crystal clear understanding that no trips down the aisle or rededications can do the trick. I pray that they will trust the work of the one who gave his life a ransom for many, died in our place, burying our sins, all of them, even the ones that society doesn't call sin anymore, that if we will trust you, you will take away our sins. Thank you, Lord, for the reality that that was secured when you raised your son from the grave. And Lord, we thank you for the power of the gospel and this earth-shattering book. And we ask you to bless it and the preaching in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll begin reading in verse 27 of Mark chapter 11. I almost sent you turning again. Mark chapter 11. Did I say Matthew before? Okay, I just heard pages turning. I'm like, what did I do? All right. So Mark chapter 11, look at verse 27. Then they came again to Jerusalem. Let's identify who that is. It is Jesus, verse 22. It is his disciples in verse 15. They came to Jesus. Jesus went into the temple. Who's they again? The disciples at the end of chapter 11, verse 14, and Jesus. And you might notice that he comes in on what we might call Palm Sunday at the beginning of chapter 11. And you might notice verse 12 begins Monday. And then you notice in verse 20 begins, see it? Verse two, look at verse 20, in the morning. Uh, that means this, it is a new day. So this takes place on Tuesday. All of this takes place on Tuesday. As you page forward and you take a look, it is Tuesday of the week Jesus died until chapter 14, verse 1. Look there. Look there. Chapter 14, verse 1. After two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is what we would call Maundy Thursday. So what do we not have any record of in the Gospels during Passion Week? What day of the week? Wednesday. It's a silent day. No one knows what happened on Wednesday of Passion Week. Tuesday takes all of chapter 12, all of chapter 13, much of chapter 11, and then it begins with Thursday in chapter 14. And continues right on through to Resurrection Day on Sunday. <laughs> That's a great day. It ain't great because your team plays. It's great because Jesus got up from the dead. Amen. Even if your team plays. All right. So, and, and it is, it is wonderfully, it is wonderfully Tuesday. And not only is it Tuesday, but all of chapter 11, verse 27, through chapter 13, verse 1, happens in the temple. Take a look. Chapter 11, verse 27, as they came again to Jerusalem, as he walked in the temple. Then in chapter 13, verse 1, then as he went out of the temple. So what we're about to read today takes place on Tuesday in the temple. That's right. All of it does. And so in verse 27, then they came again to Jerusalem as he was walking in the temple. The chief priests, scribes, and elders came to him. Do you have the slides that I sent you earlier in the week? If so, throw them up there. Okay, anyways, I'm seeing a pattern. I'm, I am going to bring a dry erase board up here so that nothing gets lost in cyberspace. And that way I can just do my maps and it would just like minority report all over again. If you haven't seen that movie, I haven't either. Okay, so, uh, so on the east side, if you can imagine it with me, imagine there's a map up there. And over on the east side of the city, there is the eastern gate of Jerusalem. And it's not the fault of the lady behind the computer. I'm, it's all me, okay? So on the, on the right side of the city is the eastern gate of Jerusalem. And immediately, what shares a wall with the city is the temple. So when you walk in the eastern gate of the city, you are in fact walking into the eastern gate of the temple. And Jesus has done it for three straight days. Sunday, he did it on Palm Sunday. Look at verse 11 of chapter 11. Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. That's Sunday. Monday, verse 15. 
they came to Jerusalem, Jesus went into the temple. So now it's Tuesday, and the people in charge of the temple are pretty sure he's going to come again. And so, in chapter 11, verse 27, they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, chief priests and scribes and elders came to him. Not only had he been in the temple Sunday and Monday, and now they were expecting him Tuesday, but he wasn't all that much of a crowd queller either. Sunday, he rode in on the foal of a donkey with a bunch of kids crying Hosanna into the temple. Monday, he goes into the temple and flips tables and whips people. They're expecting that when he comes back into the temple, it will not be a peaceful discourse. So as Jesus comes in the eastern gate of the city and into the eastern gate of the temple, which are one and the same, if you look at a map, you'll see that, uh, then now they are expecting more trouble, more trouble. And so they meet him as he comes in the gate. Can you see it? Can you see in the eastern gate? Here comes Jesus and his disciples. Here comes the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. They're meeting them inside the eastern gate. They're going to have a rumble in the jungle. If it hurts everybody, they're going to have some time to talk. In verse 28, they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? What things? The, the, the cacophony that he started on Monday. Where's Andrew call? Where are you sitting? Wave at me. The kerfuffle that he caused on Monday, the, the cacophony he caused on Sunday. They want to know, here you are, you're back. I'll bet you're not here to do a day camp sort of come make your wallet with Jesus outing in the craft barn. It's going to be difficult. They're expecting Jesus to make some trouble, and they want to know why. Who gave you the authority to do all this? Who gave you the authority to come into this temple and do what you're doing? Jesus answered and said to them, verse 29, I will also ask you one question. See, when someone asks a question, they are assuming the role of the teacher. Jesus did not answer their question. Well, he answered their question with a question. And in doing so, he was saying, not only are you a teacher, I am a teacher. And he says, I will answer you with a question, and then answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. So Jesus is posing a riddle, except it's only a riddle to those who are trying to hide, because it's a very straightforward question. Verse 30, the baptism of John that we read about in chapter 1, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. And Jesus drops the mic. In verse 31, they reasoned among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, now this is what they're saying, they all get together. I mean, do you imagine this? They all huddle up, slot 42 on three, break. What do we say? If we say from heaven, if we say from heaven, he will say, well, then why did you not believe him? But if we say from men, they feared the people, for all counted John to have been a prophet indeed. So they answered. They broke from their huddle and said, uh, we can't tell you. And Jesus, in his diplomatic way, says in verse, end of verse 33, neither would I tell you by what authority I do these things. So this is an issue of authority. And we go forward in the chapter, chapter 12, he began to speak to them in parables. In other words, what we are now about to read in this parable, we've already covered on a Sunday night in September in our message entitled, Baptists and the Bible. What do Southern Baptists believe about the Bible? And just for clarity, this church was Southern Baptist a long time before I got here. I didn't do it. All right, so we get to verse number one. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Jesus is telling a story. Now at vintage time, verse two, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed. All right, so again, he sent them. So the, the owner of the vineyard, sent them another servant, verse 4, and at, at him they threw stones and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully treated, verse 5. And again, he sent another. The owner of the vineyard is sending messenger after messenger after messenger to get feedback and fruit from the time that they've had this vineyard. And, the, and, and again, he sent another, and him they killed, and many others beating some and killing some, therefore still having one son. Now, who do you think he's talking about? Yeah. The owner of the vineyard has one son, and Jesus is now talking about himself in the third person. 
his beloved, his beloved son, he also sent him to them last. So, so are, you, are you getting this? That word last is very important. This will come in handy on our Sunday nights in our series on the end times when we teach through Mark 13 on Sunday nights. Mark 13 will be Sunday nights. Israel had a last prophet. Who was it? Jesus. They sent him, the father sent him last, verse 6. They will respect my son. But those vine dressers said among themselves, this is the heir. Come let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him, killed him, cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what, Jesus is still talking, Mark is still writing in red, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Jesus is hinting here that it won't be long, Israel, you'll no longer be the focus of God. It will be somebody else. Verse 9, he'll give, come and destroy the vine dressers. He'll come and destroy them. If Jesus was the last prophet and Jesus and, and the, the father, the owner of the vineyard, is going to come and destroy the vine dressers, destroy the vine dressers, it should be to us, the reader, we should immediately think, well, then probably there's not a 2,000 year window between their rejection of Christ and the destruction of the vine dressers. You, believe the Bible, it's so clear. So he came and destroyed the vine dressers. You have to ask yourself, when did he do that or when will he do it? And give the vineyard to others. Verse 10, have you not read this scripture? Now he's quoting, believe it or not, the same psalm that we sang this morning. Jesus is about to quote Psalm 118. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It was marvelous in our eyes. And they sought to lay hands on Jesus, but feared the multitude, for they knew he had spoken the parable against them. So they left him and went away. This first question that begins in chapter 11 is one of authority and origin. Often we say that Jesus asks questions seeking the honesty of those whom he's examining. Jesus never asks questions because he's ignorant of a topic. God never did that in the Garden of Eden. Jesus never did that when he asked questions. He's not asking questions to seek information. He is asking questions to seek the integrity of the person he's asking. When Jesus shows up in our life, he knows our answers. He wants you to hear your answer. To see if you're a person of honor. So I ask you today, do you have the proper authority? Jesus' use of this counter question was not his evading their question, but establishing his own authority as the chief teacher on the scene that day. The question that will be answered is mine, Jesus said. And they reason amongst themselves. So Jesus is asking a question with only two possible answers. There's no false dichotomy here. He apparently knew they would affirm that there were two options. It's kind of like this. Is uh, there a God? If we say that there are everything today is from God, we'll have to answer questions about why we're not obeying him. What about Jesus? Is he a good teacher? Or is he more? One might say, if he, we say he is a good teacher, then we might be asked why we do not believe what he as a good teacher says. On the other hand, if we say he's more than just a good teacher, we will be expected to honor him as one who is more than just a teacher. You see, what we come up with in the answers really matters because it requires action. So... So on the basis of their answer, which was no answer at all, he tells them a story, and they are the main characters. Well, God is, and they get to play along. He knows, he knows what we're dealing with here is an issue of authority. I want you to ask yourself, is Jesus really your Lord? Oh, of course he is. I mean, he's the Lord. He's Lord. I have it on my bumper sticker. Of course he's Lord. And the idea of Jesus being Lord means that he's boss. Think about that thing in your life that makes you very uncomfortable when it comes to obedience. Let me right up, right up front with you. I have no more reminders of this than when I am driving. Maybe you do too. Maybe you do too. I, I don't know. It's possible that every now and then you also have a hard time obeying the speed limit. It's, it's possible that someone in here besides me and Dennis struggle with that. <laughs> And, and, and so what do we do when we're talking about authority? 
The reality is we love our sin more than others. We're typically really hard on other people and really easy on ourselves. We're ready for God to rain his judgment on others and really hopeful that he shows mercy to us. Um, that, that is indication that we have forgotten who our authority is. If Jesus is from heaven, then when we read this book and we're confronted with truths, we ought to be honest enough to say, I can't be, I can't be on the fence on this. I, I just can't be. And so we go on to question two, verse 13. Then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and Herodians. So these are not the first group, the, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. This is a second group that was sent from the first group. These are the Pharisees and the Herodians. And look what they want to do in verse 13. They want to catch Jesus in his words. When they had come, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. <laughs> it sounds like Jesus is... 